Good afternoon, and uh, just keep chewing, it's all good. <laughs> um, you know, my talk today is about Beyond Code, right? We're talking about Drupal's community, its impact, and its possibilities, and, and why should you care about hearing from, about this uh, from me? Um, so I've led Palantir uh, for over 25 years now, <laughs> which is a long time. And um, we've been both using and contributing to Drupal since 2006. Um, I've been a member of the community myself, like an actual contributing member since uh, I think for 16 and a half years now. And um, as Wilbur said, I, uh, this is my 12th year serving on the board of directors of the Drupal Association. So um, it's basically, Dries and I are like the last ones standing on this one. So um, I think that uh, in addition to all of that stuff, I've organized camps, uh, organized DrupalCon Chicago. So I, I kind of have this really long perspective, but beyond all of that stuff, um, I'm just a systems thinker. I like to see the whole. I like to see the patterns and the connections and that, that tissue that, that makes it something more than, than it might otherwise be. And so I think pretty deeply about these kinds of things. So with that, um, I want to know about you. So obviously I want to thank all the organizers of Twin Cities for, um, for putting this on. This is my first camp back, so I appreciate whatever grace you're going to extend me while you're eating. I'm hoping you're distracted. Um, with, a, with a good lunch. So um, I'm curious, who here is um, new to Drupal or this is your first Drupal event? That's awesome. That is awesome. You are so welcome and we're so glad to have you here. Um, I'm really excited about that. That kind of percentage, it looked at like I don't know, about 10% of the room was new and that's really good. Um, I think that that was uh, a little bit lower, even pre-pandemic. So I'm really excited to see some new faces. I'm excited to have you here. Um, but I'm also curious for those of you who've been around for a while. So I'm interested, who has gotten to use Drupal 10 so far? Okay. All right, keep your hand up if Drupal 9. Okay. What about 8? All right. All right. So the, just just so you know, because time got broken. I don't for me in the last three years. I don't know about you, but uh, that's eight years already. If we're going back to Drupal to Drupal eight, okay. I <laughs> just wanted to point that out for you. All right. Um, let's go a little bit further. All right. So keep your hand up if you worked with, in, or on Drupal seven. <coughs> Fun fact: There's still. 380,000 sites that are on Drupal 7, all right? And, and obviously, I mean, I think this is actually the biggest density of people in rooms on Drupal 7, and that's not a surprise. It was the big party, like that's the biggest uh, version so far, and it was around for a really long time. I mean, it's still around. Um, all right, let, let's, keep, let's keep doing this. Anybody recognize the ugly blog? All right, here we go. Uh, on Drupal 6, so now we're back in 2008. <laughs> Okay. 2008. All right. What about what about Drupal 5? Let's go back to 07. Okay. All right. We had you know Drupal 5. If you didn't know, right, was uh, views and CCK for the win, right? It was uh, also fun fact, right? Uh, does anybody else remember when it was the best practice to put PHP snippets into the content and nodes? <laughs> That was a great idea. PHP filter, anybody? Yeah, okay, all right, here we go. All right, anybody else? We're gonna go to the before times, before Drupal 5. Here we go. These are all the fours when we counted funny. All right, so uh, four, seven, yeah. This is, this is where I have to bow out. That was my first one. Uh, then we've got all the different ones. Uh, so four, seven, four, six, four, five. Uh, so now we're back at 2005, all right, then we've got 4.4, uh, four, which was 06-ish, uh, or no, no, uh, that's 2004. 2004? Okay, did we, did we hit everybody? We got everybody out at 04? That's pretty impressive, by the way. There are so many projects that aren't even that old, not to like out ourselves or anything. But, um, you know, then we had so many versions of Drupal 4, um, and then you've got Good old Drupal 3, which none of us recognize or remember, which is fine. Um, but this is pretty much what 
Dries released uh, back in his dorm room in 2001. So these are Drupal 1, 2, and 3 are all from 2001. Now, again, time is super broken for me, <laughs> but that's a long time. <laughs> like, that is such a long time ago. And what I will say is that change is our only constant. So many things are different now. So, it, you know, I think when we talk about Drupal, uh, it's really tempting to think about it as the product, to think about it as the code. But code that was written in 2001 is not what we're running today. It's not modern Drupal. Um, you know, and, and so I, wanna, I want everybody to kind of hang with me here for a second. Because after 22 years, right, I kind of think of Drupal, the product, as the ship of Theseus. So, right, if anybody's not like a WandaVision fan or a classics nerd, I'll, I'll explain what that means. But so, so the idea is that the ship of Theseus, like Plutarch says, okay, the Athenians wanted to preserve Theseus' ship. So as the pieces of the ship rotted, they replaced it over and over and over again. So how many, like, how long does it still remain Theseus' ship if you have literally replaced all of its parts? Okay, just a little thought experiment for your lunch today. But I like this as a way to start to understand and unpack what Drupal is, because it's not the same code that was, but we're still Drupal. And with that, nothing is the same as it was in the beginning, and yet we are still, we still do have that Drupal identity. So I also want to take just a minute and say, you know, Drupal isn't about a person either, right? Obviously, we've had a very steadfast founder in Dries, and I'm grateful for that. But he wears even more hats than I do, but he cannot do it alone. We would not be here today but for all the people who contributed over this time. So there have been so many individuals who contributed super essential things, who you thought, oh my God, Drupal is web check, or Drupal is this other person, or this other person. You know, especially those folks who were involved in one, two, and three, when Stephen Winton's left, it was a big deal. Or when the other Drees left, it was a big deal. Like, it, it felt big, and yet it wasn't. It's because Drupal isn't about any one person. So it isn't about the code. It isn't about any one person, but Drupal is able to survive because it is specifically about the things that aren't those. So, this is uh, Portland 2013. Hands up if anybody's actually in this photo. Yeah, yeah. So, I really, I appreciate you playing along, right? I asked you all to do that because it's one, just fun for me to know, like, how long the room's been hanging in, so it helps me calibrate a little bit. But, um, but anytime I talk about the past or the present or the future of Drupal, it is about people, the collective of all of us. It's about our culture. It's about the things that we do beyond just writing some PHP or pulling in APIs or whatever um, other innovations we're working on. Um, Drupal is everything that it is because of all of us. And I absolutely mean every single one of us in the room, the folks who raised their hands because this is their first event and the folks who have been here back through, you know, all of the fun of four. Um, but if you're here for the whole time, 22 years, or you've been here because somebody dragged you here this morning for two hours and 22 minutes or whatever, you are why Drupal is what it is, and you're part of this ecosystem that actually makes it work. So I have spent <coughs> more hours than is probably healthy, trying to understand what the Drupal community is. We talk about it a lot, you'll hear it referred to, and this is the most expansive version that I've been able to come up with after all that time spent thinking about it, right? That Drupal is an ecosystem, right, that is built by contributors of code and of non-code, it on an infrastructure that is hosted by the Drupal Association, so we're all there. It's supported by businesses, used by people and organizations to power more than 2% of the top million sites on the web. That's what Drupal is. It's all of those things, and it takes all of those pieces for it to be successful. And I think it's really helpful to hold on to this notion that Drupal has made, like, Billions, it's generated billions of dollars in the economy. 
Like it is incredibly successful. But beyond that, it's changed so many lives. I don't know if anybody in this room, anybody in this room think that Drupal's changed their life? It's changed mine. That's pretty cool. But so when we start to talk about Drupal and we start to think about this community, I think one of the most enduring, one of the most durable parts of it is our culture. And encapsulated in that are these, these stories that we tell ourselves, right? They become a driver. They're why we've been able to achieve what we achieved and they've why, they're why we've stayed so resilient. I mean, there were a lot of versions of Drupal, right? I mean, we may think that we're on Drupal 10, which we are. That's because we changed counting. Did you see how many fours there were? Like, there's a lot of versions of Drupal 4, right? Um, and we are this massive, like very massive. There are hundreds of thousands of people who throughout the last 22 years have worked on Drupal. Like you're part of this really big club. Probably won't meet all of them ever. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it really does have this durability that's very interesting. It's unlike any of the other open source projects, right? Of the top 10 open source projects, we're the only one that's run by a not-for-profit, non the Drupal Association. The others either have uh, you know, a, a single company behind them, think Mongo, um, you know, or they are run by a trade association, which is not unlike oligarchs, so Linux for anybody, um, or even Red Hat. We know what, what troubles lie there. But, so Drupal has been run by people, for people, for the benefit of all, for a really long time. And because we've been charting our path on our own, it's been hairy at times. Like, you know, we, we have a lot of things there. But I think one of the things that as we reflect and as we express this kind of gratitude for this, like, amazing product, unlikely product, unlikely community that has emerged over the last, you know, over the, the 2000s, essentially, um, I think it's important to focus on the stories that we tell ourselves. Because th that's what we hold on to. That's what people end up... Uh, coming to and so if we I want to take this time today to talk about three of these narratives because the last 20 years has been a lot has happened and it's how we as a culture shift those stories that we tell ourselves I think that start to indicate our progress and so as a as a systems thinker I'm very curious about how we influence that and I'm also looking to the future right wearing my board hat so I've got a board hat I've got my Palantir hat I'm a program lead for you know major clients I've got all these different hats I wear and they all come together in my little systems brain so let's get started we have enough people in the room who probably remember the eat your own dog food stage of Drupal so you know back in 2001 we didn't have GitHub, so Drupal wrote essentially one we host self-hosted subversion which was not fun. Um, it, was, it was great, though. I mean, it, there were advantages to it. We didn't have issue uh, tracking software, right? So we wrote it in the project module. Like, all of the things that we needed to be social as a community, Drupal home group in Drupal, right? So I don't recommend it. We learned a lot, so it was fine. But I think that it's really impressive that we were able to accomplish so much with so much of this homegrown. But even camps, I, anybody here remember COD? Right, there was a, a camp, <laughs> the organizer's distribution. Like we thought Drupal needed to be everything and we were gonna do everything in Drupal. I mean, it was controversial if somebody suggested doing event registration for DrupalCon, not in Drupal. And now we're kind of okay with that. Like we, we've, we've moved on. We understand, we're gonna get off this Drupal Island. There's even a track here, right, called Get Off the Drupal Island. We're gonna do what we're best at. And so, evolving that narrative from, you know, you must eat your own dog, you must use your own software, and Drupal can be everything to everyone all of the time. Thankfully, we have let that go. It's on a little ship, and we now come to our own island, right? So we use Git, thank God. We are moving to GitLab, hooray. We use Slack. Um, you know, all of the different things, uh, you know, to register for this camp. I used a SaaS service, you know, all of the camps pretty much do that. So I think that there's, um, I think there's value in understanding what it is we're trying to do and for whom. Um, and that kind of focus has allowed Drupal to connect, to sustain. We had kept spinning our wheels. I mean, it's one of the things wearing my Drupal Association hat that has held us back. I mean, it's really hard to upgrade Drupal.org. It's, it's embarrassing a little bit, 
that we're not on, you know, triple 10 yet. Um, or not. Um, but, you know, it's because we have so much of this technical debt around things we grew ourselves. And we're working really hard to actually integrate with other systems so that we can really focus on what Drupal does well. And maybe we can even start to showcase things that Drupal does exceedingly well, better than others, like multilingual. It's been a dream for a long time for many of us in the, on the board to have a Drupal.org be multilingual. Because Drupal's really good at that. Um, but we don't showcase it yet. So another one of the stories that we told ourselves a lot when, um, you know, when, in, in the old times, in the then times, um, was that talk is silver and code is gold. And it was like, well, did, did you check it in? And I understand where that comes from, right? There's, there's a notion that, it, you know, you don't want to just claim a problem space. And there, you know, in the early kind of, in the 4.6, 4.7 days, there are people who are working on big things in Drupal and they kind of claim out of space and say, hey, I'm gonna do this thing. So that's around the time where you started to see um, talk is silver and code is gold. But it turns out that what really mattered for all of us was to come for the code and stay for the community. Um, Drupal is so old that um, that papers are written about it, like academic papers study Drupal and its community. And, it, and you know, you think about the value, um, or I think people who aren't in our community often think about the value as being the code itself. What's interesting is there was a study uh, done in 2013 by a Babson professor named Jonathan Sims, who studied, and you know, okay, yeah, Drupal people, they just want to like talk to each other. Like, does that make business sense? Like, does that, from a business perspective, what is that value? And so what he found is, he, is that the Drupal businesses that contributed both code and help, which is what he kind of bucketed in all of these community-oriented contributions, running a camp, participating in IRC, doing mentoring events, all that other stuff, that all of those folks who, all the businesses that did that, um, experienced no loss in productivity in their own work, but their own work was more innovative. So by being part of the community, you gained something, even though it seemed like. I think the battery died. All right, so, so we look at it and we're like, okay, businesses, it makes sense for you to like let your folks go to a Drupal camp, let them go to a Drupal con, let them participate in IRC and working groups and all of those things. So what we, we end up seeing is that Drupal spends a lot of time, I don't know if you've noticed, but we spend a lot of time thinking about the interactions between people. So while we're no longer creating, you know, writing our own issue queues, thank God, um, we do invest a lot in things like rewriting our code of conduct in plain language. But that took a huge effort. Not only did we spin up the community working group, which helps us handle the conflicts between ourselves when, when people might have big feelings, um, we also created a community health team to expand that out beyond the people on the community working group. That's impressive. That's what we choose to spend our time on because it's valuable. It's what makes Drupal so resilient, um, those kinds of investments. Our local communities um, are collaborating, and there's playbooks now. And we're, we're, we're maturing as an organization, like as a big global movement. That maturation has not always been guided. <laughs> like it just kind of, but, but it was individuals who brought their own talent, their own insights that kept driving it. And Drupal's always had a place for people to innovate. So whether you were innovating in code or you were innovating in our interactions, that community is better for those contributions. Your employer was better for those contributions. I would argue that society is better for having had those contributions. So the third story that we like to tell ourselves um, was about scratch your own itch. And I get it, right? This comes from that kind of entrepreneurial place. And what it means is, if you're not familiar with it, is that you know, if you've got a problem, you get to solve it. And that was the idea, is that Drupal, you would often hear a, a Drupal described as this like big box of Legos out on the floor, and you could either put them together, some people might have you know, a pattern for you to follow, and if you didn't like it, you could make your own Lego. Right? That, was, that was Drupal um, at this time. And, I understand where this comes from, right? We had a, what's it called, a BDFL, or Benevolent Dictator for Life structure, and we still do. Um, but what was harmful, or didn't serve us very well, out of this scratch your own itch, is that it started to develop kind of really hierarchical expectations and some anti-patterns. Um, people felt like they had to have Dries' blessing 
on something before they would do something big. And so sometimes you would either have these brutal, absolutely brutal um, threads of attrition where you're like, I'm going to just argue until everyone else is tired. Because <laughs> I will win. And that will mean I was right. Good Lord. Um, or you'd have people who would make arguments to an audience of one. That's also super harmful. Because no one of us, no matter how amazing and smart and all the things that Dries is, he's never going to have a monopoly on all the good ideas. He's never going to recognize all the good ideas. That's the power of the community. So Dries recognizes at the time, I remember working with him, and he's like, we've, we've got to start to create some structure here. So this is where you start to see those working groups start to emerge because everybody was just, everything was escalating to Dries from all fronts whether it was the association escalated to Dries, the project escalated to Dries, infrastructure escalated to Dries, interpersonal conflicts would escalate to Dries. I mean, it, just, it didn't make sense, right? It just does not work at scale. So by creating this structure, we did start to, um, you know, we maintained the fact that we are a peer-based community. And there were people at the time who fiercely argued that we should be more authoritarian, that we should, instead of, maintaining the structures or creating these structures that allowed us to be continue to be peer-based, that we should instead uh, create a hierarchy of leaders and roles and really start to, to firm, firm those things up. Let's just, let's put a person in charge of this and a person in charge of that. We didn't. So this is when, you know, we started to really talk about the, and, and I think in a couple of Dries notes, he referenced the if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. So this is the kind of go together era of, um, of Drupal, right? That we, we do think in terms of working groups and we think in terms of scale and we think in terms of collaboration. Um, one of the major innovations, non-code innovations that Drupal has is the notion of the contribution credit system. So if you're an old school open source person, you may know that Open source was all about the individual contributor. What did I do? And I'm going to show it, and you're going to you see all my work. You'll know who I am. You know what I did. You know how smart I am. All those things were all baked into open source. But um, because we wanted to take advantage of some opportunities, um, and it actually came out of the White House. The White House says, okay, we want to use open source, but we have to be able to, to track what we contributed, what the what White House was responsible for contributing. So there was, a, there was a big debate at the time around, well, would we just let the White House have a, an account to contribute from? Right? That's the easy way to solve it, and a lot of communities do that. But that stripped the individuals of their, of their pride of ownership or their rights to ownership and in having done that work. So we're like, no, that won't work. Let's create this concept of the organization. So that, that little change is what made the contribution credit system possible. And I also think that it's really important to notice that when we did create that system, we allowed there to be a path, albeit a little jankier, um, for non-code contributions, but we do recognize non-code contributions in the credit system. It's, that's been baked in from the beginning. And that's a very Drupal-y thing. Others can learn that kind of from us, but what it does is it makes that work, that essential non-code work that kept us functional, kept us innovative, kept us productive as a community, it surfaces it, and it says it's worthy of recognition. It says it's worthy of visibility, and those are important things to us. We don't get it right all the time, but we do try, and we do recognize it. So if the last three years have taught me anything or left me with anything other than kind of weariness and exhaustion, um, what it did is it reinforced just how volatile, just how uncertain, um, how complex, and how ambiguous things are. That's the world we live in, and we're going to keep living in that world, sorry. Um, but I, even in spite of all that, which are my caveats to any tea leaf reading, um, I will say that there are emergent paths to recognize and opportunities that I see um, for the kind of where these narratives, where these stories and how they're evolving, what, what that means for us moving forward. So I do see the future kind of as uh, networked. So what we've done over the last few years is we've really focused on building out, whether it's a strategic initiative or community working group, we've created these kind of structures that um, are centralized, and that was important. We needed to facilitate, like, we needed to kind of move in that direction where we could coordinate some of the big things, because Drupal's really complex. If you want to do a big innovative thing, it's going to involve, it's going to touch a lot of things, and it's going to involve a lot of people, and so you need some sort of centralization to that. But 
I think the next phase of this is really to focus on this notion of creative partnership and series of, of you know, essentially teams that can work on different things. You break down the complex system into smaller pieces and allow that innovation to happen. Right? That's what gets us back to, um, to something people can actually wrap their arms around. You know, core is so intense that if you want to do a big thing, um, there's very few people you could partner with in thought or in code to be able to do all of those things. And I, I think there's a shift coming from uh, that kind of scarcity, only some people can do this, or oh, it's so big, over to abundance. And to make that shift, what we need to have happen is, is to break down what's the scope that they're looking at and, and look at those things. So it really does move us more toward this creative partnership. Um, I see a role for the DA in that. I think it could be facilitated. Um, you know, I, I've been pushing for a few years now around flexibility um, and allowing, understanding that, um, that time is a privilege, right? Having free time to contribute to open source is a privilege. Um, and then that shows up in lots of different ways, right? It's, it, the distribution of free time is not equitable. Um, and also, from a, a business perspective, like, Palantir does big things in Drupal, sometimes, right? We'll do something when we can. You know, I used our PPP money back in the beginning of the pandemic to write Rector. If anybody wants to know what I did with that, I was like, I'm going to spin up a whole team and we're going to write, and we're going to do this. I see an opportunity for Drupal to work smarter, not harder, and that just so appeals to the DuckTales nerd in me. And I'm like, let's do this thing. And I could, I could pull all the people together and we could get it done really fast. I like putting an entire team of people on things rather than donating a person to something. And I think there are a lot of businesses that are like that because people are left with, hey, I work really hard to build this, this team dynamic and I want to get something, see something and get it done from start to finish. Like that's, that's how we work, that's how we think. And I think there are a lot of other folks like us on that. So I think what we'll start to see is um, the ability for both businesses and individuals to, depending on what's available to them in that moment, to donate their time, their talent, or their money interchangeably because we need all of them, right? And we want to be able to, to have all of those be recognized as important drivers of, of our community. So I think as we continue this decentralization, um, right now we've, we've centralized a lot of things back up and we don't see too many big things that come up from the community fully formed. Um, I, I do think that we're moved toward a more networked model where we have teams of teams um, that enable us to start distributing decision making in ways that we haven't yet seen. Um, so I think that's a big sign of maturity for the community. Um, I think that will also help us remain really focused because that focus that we gained by not trying to eat our own dog food all the damn time, I think was really, um, really innovative for us and really freeing for us. So I don't want to see us fall back in that. So. Um, I think the next theme is really about us becoming regenerative as an ecosystem. So when we think about ourselves as an ecosystem, we need to think about why do people stay? Like, there are a lot of people who spend a lot of time working in, with, or on Drupal. Um, so really understanding um, that value that we all created together and being able to, to, to channel it back into making sure that there's another day for Drupal. So there, um, Tell me if this resonates for any of you, but there are some folks who've been in roles for a really long time. And, um, and you know, I think that Drupal has a bit of an anti-pattern in that uh, a lot of people burn out. You, you hold something until you can't possibly hold that thing anymore because you don't know what would be next for you, right? That's not a great pattern. That doesn't actually recognize um, that we need to bring new folks in and we need to create meaningful roles for them, and there needs to be a next for the folks who have held those roles before. So really starting to think about what does succession planning look like? And I do mean in all roles, what does that look like for us? I think it's time to have that conversation. I think it's time to think about strengthening the protocols of what it means to be a member of this community. Um, I think we have a pretty um, intuitive sense of what it means for an individual. I think we have a, a very immature and underdeveloped sense of what it means for organizations. Because I think most of the value that Drupal has been responsible for creating over the last 22 years is not in the community anymore. It's not here. Uh, we didn't capture it. We didn't, we didn't make sure that it was there to make sure the next day was there. So you know, we need to be really clear about what actions help Drupal to thrive. Because I think some people were extractive of value not because they 
we're, you know, ha ha ha, I'm going to take this out. But I think there's, we just didn't have a clear path for them. How might they contribute and be involved in ways that are aligned for them, but also serve the community? Um, and, and I think that um, we also need to start to differentiate what parts of Drupal are a public good, like a road. Everybody gets to ride, like drive on the road, whether you pay your taxes or not. That's cool, no problem. And what parts of it are a common good? Things that you know people tend and take care of, and they should they should see the benefits of. So right now, I think we skew a little bit too far in thinking that things that are really cost centers for Drupal are a public good, and they're not. I don't think that they are. So I think there's a lot to kind of come from that perspective too. And the last thing is, I really am excited about listening. <laughs> I think the next phase for us is is really as we've moved off the island and we gain this big picture awareness, I think it's about understanding ourselves as an ecosystem and listening to what the ecosystem tells us, right? So this is really that, I, I see this next stage is kind of think globally, act locally um, for Drupal. Um, if we're thinking out another 25 years or another 100 years, um, what we want is we need to tend to our own ecosystem. We need to understand that there will always be parts of us who are, um, if anyone's familiar with, with Simon Wardley, he talks about there are, um, there are pioneers, the people who are innovating, the people who are doing things that have never been done before. Then there's the settlers, the people who are like, yeah, I'm gonna take these things that are new, I'm gonna take these things that are old, I'm gonna put them together in a kind of custom built area. And then there, there are town planners who are like, it needs to be mature, it needs to be stable. Let's make sure that the bridge doesn't collapse. You know, I think there's just things like that that are really important and what, and who we need more of or who we listen to at any given time is going to ebb and flow. So we need a really dynamic understanding of how we start to um, respond to our own landscape. But we also need to start being a lot more aware of the landscape beyond us, the bigger landscape. I think sometimes we do a little bit with open source, which is great. Um, but I think that, that there's more that can be done. Like Drupal's never really done advocacy. Um, it's just never been a priority for us. But um, I don't know, I put up here the um, Open Web Manifesto. Like, Drupal is all about your data integrity. It's about allowing people to have access to it. Dries has been talking about the Open Web for, I think, 08. I remember I have, I have some pictures of slides with him from, from at least that far back. Um, about you owning your own data, being able to do what you want, your portability, not having the internet become a bunch of walled gardens. Um, I think this is the time that we need to fight that fight. And so understanding Drupal's place in that um, is really key. And um, I don't know how widely this is understood, but uh, the EU has a, a, a new piece of regulation they're considering called the Cyber Resilience Act. And um, it's not as open source friendly as you might imagine. Because um, the EU is actually one of the biggest supporters of open source, and they really encourage it. Um, and so we have a lot of a big footprint there. But um, you know, there's just things in that uh, in the draft that are like uh, you can't release unfinished software. I'm like, I don't think that Drupal's ever going to be done. So what does that mean? Like I don't understand. So what I think is really interesting is that the Drupal Association partnered with Typo3, WordPress, and Open Source Matters. And they've started to advocate and to lobby for this. There was an open letter uh, that you know, pretty much called to their attention how harmful this uh, in its current state would be <laughs> to open source and how inconsistent it was with EU values. And, um, you know, and, and I, I, think that, I think there's more to come of that. Right? I think as, as we move forward, I'm really excited to see us become more situationally aware of where our own community is at, but also what our role is in the, in the broader community. So, you know, thinking about this ecosystem, I kind of think about it like a garden. Um, and, you know, again, as a system thinker, I'm like, well, you, you plan, and then there's what happens. <laughs> you know, you, you can plant things, and you can have this beautiful vision, but what happens is what's gonna happen. And you're cool with that. And you tend it, and you prune it, and you give it a lot of care and attention. And Drupal, I think, is amazing because it really does balance that innovation, that speed that we want to have to be a modern competitor in, in the market today in, in the kind of needs that we all have from our um, you know, content management system and our, our software like that. But it also balances care, care for each other, care for our ecosystem, care for, the, um, you know, for our technical debt, care for our infrastructure. We care about all of those things. 
So um, it really is like a garden, right? We tend it and what we focus on. But there's just going to be this constant cycle of renewal, of growing and thriving and then pruning away the things that don't serve us anymore. And I think that, that really has been true in our past. I'm excited to see that be true in our future. Um, but you know, ultimately, these last three things I talked about, you know, listening and creating essentially a regenerative um, economy around our ecosystem, and then, um, and then really focusing on, on essentially teams of teams doing kind of big things. Um, those, that's what I see from the emergent opportunities, and um, and I have various hats, and I'm working on all of those things. So I'm not, you know, not just, you know, prognosticating. Like I'm, I, I see, I see effort going. I just don't know how successful it will be, but that's my effort. And I think what is most important is, you know, what are you going to plant? What do you want to tend? What's important to you? Because all of us are this community. No one of us is this community. So I think the most meaningful question I'm going to leave you with is, you know. What do you want to do next? What do you see next for Drupal? And what have you gotten from it that's given you meaning? What no longer serves you? Um, and, and what are you going to do about it? What do you want to do? And what support do you need? So um, with that, I just wanted to thank you. Um, I think there's a couple minutes for questions if anyone has any questions. There's also an unconference today, so if anything I said you know, sparks your imagination or you want to talk more deeply about it, I'm, I'm, I'll be around for the unconference. But um, yeah, thank you. I would advise you to get a team together. <laughs> That's why. And so, and on that team, you need to have someone who's you need to have all the different roles that you would have for your own team. So whether it's a team from your company that's going to do it, or a team of people that commit to it together, I think that the if you want to do something big, you get all the pieces you need, and then you start talking. Right? You start talking about it. You blog about it. You um, you might want to if there is an infrastructure impact, you might want to talk to the DA about it. Um, you probably want to surface it to the core maintainer who is most adjacent to it. If you don't know, you just start to post and see who starts writing you back. Um, but that's, I mean, we're working on something, our next big thing we're working on right now um, is collaborative editing. And so those are the steps I take. I start to have meetings with people and that's how Rector happened. As, as you know, a member of our, my team came to me and said, I think this is really cool and no one will listen to me. And I was like, okay, well tell me more about that. And you know, they said, okay, this is what it would mean. And I said, all right, well, um, what would you need? And so I built out a team, and that's, that's how it ended up. I knew what was happening before I knew there was a pandemic. But the minute it happened, I dedicated an entire team of eight people to run it through. And this is one of the places where Drupal doesn't quite know what to do with that. They're like, oh, but usually we have people who have like an itch to scratch. And so the person who's you know, committing all this stuff, they care about this, and they're going to maintain it forever. <laughs> and they're going to do it for free in their spare time. And that's not actually when Palantir does a project, like Palantir is the one who's saying, hey, you're allocated to this project. What do you think about it? And, and all those different things. So um, I think we're still working on what that means if you have a team of, of from a business. And that's kind of what I mean. I think that needs to mature a little bit. But I would suggest you get a whole team together and start to, start to do it. Um, get it to the point where you have maybe a proof of concept, make a video, blog posts, post on Dinetto, um, and then start to loop in some of those uh, systems. Because right now, it is still very centralized. If you really want something, say, in 11, um, this would be the time that you're talking to all those folks. Other questions? Can you expand on the, the story of Drupal 7 into uh, modern Drupal? Like the, the story I remember from that era was uh, these, these big migrations from 5 to 6, 6 to 7, too much effort, let's do one last big one, get into 8, and then they'll be smaller after that. Uh, that, I think for some teams, has proven to be true. Like okay. they are much smoother mm -hmm. 8 onward, but as you said, majority of sites are still on seven. So what, what story do you, do you have for that situation? So I think that um, what we saw with seven was a, um, 
identified a gap in our, our leadership maturity, right? We did not have enough teams, enough resilience to be able to do the things fast enough to meet the time scale. So it, the pattern that people have become accustomed to is every three years there'd be a new version of Drupal. But some of the lifts in Drupal 7 were so heavy and so specialized that only certain people could do them. And there's only 24 hours in a day for any one person. So I see that as, um, as a really great warning for it, um, the fragility of, of not having succession plans, not having redundancy, not building in that kind of um, the team aspect. We were very much still in that single author phase. Like I can name people who were, and if you look at maintainers.txt, you can see individuals who were responsible for big pieces of it. Um, and I think what that does is it creates gatekeepers and bottlenecks. So at the time, we were very much, there was a very active tension about are we going to just start to carve up fiefdoms and give those out? And I think Drupal 7 disabused all of us that that was a good idea because um, it was just too heavy. Um, and so I remember I remember looking at the issue here. I'm like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna make this. And and I, even the date, I, I did a keynote at, at mid camp in that cycle, and I was like, if I just extrapolate this with math, because I love math, um, we're not, we're not gonna be done for you know till I forget what date I said. And it took, it took another year past my, oh my god, it can't take this long, please, date. Um, so it it was, it was a pretty big, it left a pretty big impact on us. Um, and it meant that we missed an entire generation of web technology. Um, moving from what I, I consider Drupal 7 legacy Drupal, because it is a, a fundamentally different product than Drupal 8. Um, and I think a lot of the things we've done have made Drupal 8 a little bit easier, but it's, it's far more complex. And I still think that there's different pieces we could do um, to reduce the complexity so that you don't have to know all of it to be able to impact and to innovate on different parts of it. I do like the pattern that we have now, which is, Big things don't go directly into, most big things don't go directly into core. Um, you go into contrib first, and then you have a cycle, and then you go into core. Um, and you might, you might go in fairly quickly after the big release, but I think that's been another big, another part of it, which is that the expectation is that you're gonna go into contrib first, and everyone gets to kick the tires. I think there were some pieces of seven that, um, well, a p initial pieces of eight that, um, that, you know, that might have served us. But, you know, if you remember, I think it was, there were just the long tail going into eight was hard. Um, and that really held back the adoption. And that cycle, we don't talk about Drupal 8 as being a long cycle, but if you noticed in the dates, like it was four years, like it was not three years, it was still four years. So we had a five year cycle and then we had a four year cycle. And that was really painful. And I think that's where we saw a lot of the enthusiasm um, for our pipeline to dry up. Also, PHP wasn't cool then. And I think PHP is less not cool. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and I, yeah, so I think there's just some, again, this broader landscape. <laughs> like PHP being cool or not being cool, we don't control that. That's just part of the bigger landscape. And we need to kind of understand what that, what that is and watch it. So does that answer your question? Uh, mostly. I, I, I'm also wondering, like, for, for all the people who raise their hands, like, hey, we're still on Drupal 7 sites. What, what advice are you, are you giving to teams that are, are feeling stuck on Drupal 7 right now? <clears throat> Well, shameless plug, uh, the DA just put out a whole list of people who would help you do that, and we're one of them. Um, but I, I do think that there's a moment to understand that Drupal 7 was the last version of Drupal that, that tried to pretend it was for everyone. And um, I think that we do see more focus in 8. Um, and, about, and I think it was driven by the folks who would actually do that work. Because that work was not work that could be done in your off hours. Like that needed, de there's some big pieces in Drupal 8 that needed dedicated time to write. And so because of the folks who were funding the folks who could work on it full time, we see it catering better to the needs of the kinds of clients those companies served. Right? And that's not a value judgment one way or the other, but Drupal is written by the people who have the time to write it. And they're gonna have a use case in mind and they're gonna have a set of needs that they're trying to meet. And I think that there's, um, I think that that is pretty evident. Like we recommend, we don't recommend Drupal for everything, right? Drupal, Dries likes to talk about it as Drupal's for ambitious experiences. So if you're on seven and the things you wanna do are ambitious, and by that I mean, you know, does it have integrations? Does it have a lot of data? Does it have, do you have a lot of things in it? Then okay, Drupal may be something you wanna look at. 
um, if you were using it to, um, you know, because you've been with us since it was just an ugly blog software, like maybe think about other things. Um, maybe see if that actually still serves you. You can still come. Like, it's okay. If you don't use Drupal, you're still welcome at our events. You don't lose all your social people. Like, your friends are still your friends. Like, it's the social connections of Drupal are super powerful, and I cannot tell you the number of people I've had to have this conversation with. Like, you will not lose your friends. It's okay. <laughs> it's fine. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>